Investors. I'm Matthew Cochran, a lead advisor at Seven Investing, where it is our mission to empower you to invest in your future. We do that by providing monthly stock recommendations to our premium members and educational content that is freely available to everyone. Listeners, today I am very excited to introduce Dan Klein, my good friend, former colleague, and managing editor of The Street. There are few people who have a better feel for the state of the U.S. consumer than Dan. So we're going to talk about investing in retail. More specifically, we're going to take a close look at Walmart, Target, Five Below, and Dollar General, and how these companies are navigating treacherous macro waters. At the end of the show, we have something fun, and we'll ask Dan seven questions. We like that number around here. So we'll ask him seven questions in rapid fire succession that might touch on the topics of coffee, movies, robots, and cruises. But we're going to save that for the end. I can't wait for this talk. So let's get to it. Dan, welcome to the show. Good to be back. Hello, seven investors. It has been a while. Very happy to be here. Matt, I was confused. I thought we were talking only about seasonal Halloween stores. Like, if you're going to make a <laughs> short term bet right now, I would bet big on Spirit Halloween. I don't think they're public or there's any way to invest in them, but that's going to be a big successful story. If they were public, would their stock chart like peak every October 30th and then like crash November 1st? Every, every time I drive by one, I picture the Simpsons. It was an early, an early season episode the where pumpkin. Homer's broker tells him, Homer, I told you, you have to sell your pumpkin futures before October 31st. Yes, yes. yes. He's like, I'm just going to write it out. <laughs> like, Teasing a little bit, but it has been a really bizarre few years for retail. One of the things we'll talk about a lot, one of the things I've talked about a lot is the challenge has been for all these retailers that past results are not indicative of what you need in the future. What do I mean by that? I'll go back to an example that we can all relate to. Remember the beginning of the pandemic, Matt, when everyone went Mad Max about toilet paper? You couldn't get toilet paper anywhere. Yeah. And there were all these questions. Why can't we get toilet paper? Where is the toilet paper? Are we hoarding toilet paper? The answer is pre-pandemic, 50% of the toilet paper supply went to offices. You could always go to Office Depot during the worst of the pandemic and buy the giant terrible roll of one ply toilet paper that every office has. You could always do that, but we couldn't shift our production. But now if you're a toilet paper company, which you, you might be on the side for all I know, but I don't think you are. But if you're a toilet paper company, it is very difficult to decide what percentage of toilet paper production is gonna go back into offices. And the reason offices use different toilet paper is because of the stress of the plumbing. You can't have the, the cushy, you know, quilted Northern, you know, with hundreds of people in an office building. But that's the issue everywhere across the retail chain. You know, we're going to talk about Target, and Target right now is like the cheapest place on earth to buy a TV, because Target bought too many TVs, because during the pandemic, we all bought TVs, and I'm not disparaging their ordering people, but it didn't occur to them that we all bought TVs, so we might not need another TV next year. Right, you generally like, don't buy TVs in back-to-back -back years. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, the pro it's the problem that we don't know what the supply cycle is going to be. Like a lot of people painted rooms in their houses because of the pandemic. Your home, you got to turn your abandoned room into an office or a nursery or, or whatever it is. So you painted it. Well, you're not going to need to paint it again. So is that going to affect Home Depot and Lowe's and what they should order? And I used to run a store, as we've talked about on, on many occasions. When I did the Christmas order at the toy store, I'd look at how many Legos we sold last year, how many train sets, how many slot car sets. And I'd say, well, our overall business is 12% bigger. I'll get 14% more Legos and train sets and whatever. Or, gee, I've seen a lot more interest in this area, so maybe I'll get 25% more. But you're basing it on something. Right now, history doesn't matter. And Dan, so and, and the other really big thing affecting consumers, and it's you can't escape it in the headlines, is inflation. So we have, uh, like, you can't help but notice it when you go to the grocery store, the prices are, are higher. You go out to eat, the prices are higher. Gas prices, they've come down a lot from their peak, but they're still up from like, you know, two, three years ago. So how much is this impacting like the U.S. consumer when it comes to like, I mean, some of the retailers we're talking about, but like, I can't buy a TV right now, even if I didn't buy one during the pandemic because I'm spending more on groceries. So I think some of it is overreported. And some of it is real. And, and I know this is a tough thing to say, but you have younger kids. So you are going to the grocery store and there are things you have to buy. You can't opt out of milk. 
you can't opt out of whatever you send your kids you know, for lunch or whatever the staples, it is. milk, bread, but whole cuts, etc. I go to the grocery store and I'm mostly making dinner. That's what I'm shopping for. If I look and filet mignon's a little expensive, maybe I make burgers that week. Like oh, some of us who can make substitutions, and I got to be honest, I've gotten to a point economically where I don't think about like what a gallon of milk costs. Like I always thought that was like a dummy gotcha question for political candidates because I'm not sure once you hit a certain income level, uh, you're really going to think about whether, I don't know if it's five bucks or seven bucks or four. I'm really not sure. Now, I intimately know if Starbucks raises their prices um, because you see it's right in front of you every day. But I think inflation, if you're not buying a house or a car, which are things both of us have done, you bought a car and, and I bought a house o- over the past 12 months, um, we had to move. We couldn't afford to live where we were living in the house we would have wanted to have. And we're lucky, we're both portable. We both you know, mostly work from home. My wife goes into the office a couple of times and now it's a much longer drive. And we haven't had to buy a car, which we will have to soon. Gas prices were a factor for us, but I drive a Prius. My wife drives a Nissan Sentra. They're pretty fuel efficient cars. So is it great that filling up now costs me 18 bucks instead of 30? Yeah, it's, it, it, it is. But I, I don't think it's as real as we've played it across many things because there are still deals. Like if you need a TV right now, I just bought a 43 inch TV because my wife thought the TV in our bedroom was too big. It's a whole other problem. Uh, Bought a 43 inch TV for $149 because there are too many places with TVs. During the pandemic, you could not get a laptop at a reasonable price. I used, I think it was CNET's, you know, top 10 laptops under $500 because my son needed a new laptop. And I was able to buy one of the 10 and it was slightly more than $500. Now there's no shortage of choice because they built up and they went, well, we're all home. We're all going to need laptops. It's all relative. We're going to see gas prices keep falling. We're going to see the supply chain sort itself out. We're also going to see some of these unexpected shortages. So I'll give an example. Matt, you've been to, to our, our vacation property in the, in the Disney area. My wife and I are lucky enough uh, to own a two-bedroom condo in a, in a very nice resort, and it's about four miles from a Target. A year ago, July, everyone in Florida decided they were going to drive and travel locally because Delta was going around, people didn't want to get in planes, there, there were a lot of reasons, and my resort, which is usually very slow in July, sold out, as I assume all the other resorts in the area did. So the Target near us, which has a beautiful Disney section and a lot of like travel and pool stuff right in the front, sold out of towels. You could not buy like a $5 like, like Mickey Mouse knockoff. They had probably real Mickey Mouse towel at Target. And it's not because Target's dumb. It's because last year in July, there wasn't heavy demand for towels. So you're going to see a lot of those things get evened out as we sort of figure out like, you know, when exactly are people getting in line at Starbucks? For a while, it wasn't 8 a.m. It was like 11.30 or 2. And you'd be like, wait, I'm waiting in a 45 minute line at 2 o'clock at Starbucks, we're gonna see those normal patterns start to settle in. And I think that is going to make it easier to not have like what I would call artificial shortages. Like Target doesn't have something simply because they didn't order it because in the past there wouldn't have been enough demand for it. Um, And those things are gonna sort of shake themselves out. You might also see retailers who do it better win a little bit more. And then you might also see some retailers like Best Buy get caught in Nobody needs anything Best Buy sells right now. That is not a fault of Best Buy management. We all bought the appliances we needed, the electronics we needed, and we're probably not going to replace them. You know, if you were going to buy your kids an Xbox, you bought it when they couldn't leave the house for a year. You aren't waiting to, you know, so the demand for all that, does that mean Best Buy is not a good investment? No, it just means that Best Buy is going to struggle for a year or two until we wear out our refrigerators, our televisions, or, or something new comes along that we have to have. None of this is absolute. No one's like, they're not going to sell no stoves or no refrigerators. They're just going to sell less of these things. And there is other demand. We're seeing travel demand increase. You know, So as the demand for travel goes up, well, is Target going to sell out of bathing suits? Maybe. Like, you know, they have to figure that out. And things like, I haven't seen my relatives in the Northeast for, you know, years. My mom has visited, but I haven't seen a lot of them. Well, do I need a new winter coat? Does the Target here need to stock up on winter coats, which they normally wouldn't sell? We both live in in beautiful, sunny Florida. 
Um, a lot of this is just uncharted ground. And, I, and yes, there's obviously pressure from rising interest rates and money's getting more expensive and there are things causing prices to go up, but there's also just everything isn't where it's supposed to be. We didn't have the infrastructure in place to support this, to support everybody being at home and not eating in restaurants and all the things that were happening. And we have weird artificial economies that don't work like food delivery, you know, where, where essentially that's a subsidized business that you should be paying $19.99, you know, for your delivery and it doesn't work. Just, just like taking an Uber. Like I, we've talked about this a lot. Uber should have either been more convenient or cheap. It didn't have to be both. And the reality is because they have competition, it's both and neither one of them can make any money. So I think the strong retailers, there's nothing to worry about. Like I, I, it's early to do a bottom line, but I kind of think that's the bottom line here. All right. Well, that's a great overview. So you mentioned strong retailers probably have nothing to worry about. So let's talk about like what might be those strong retailers. So like I already said, today we'll be talking about Walmart, Target, Five Below and Dollar General, a little bit more in depth. So let's start with the 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 biggest of those companies. I, Dan, I guess the good news for Walmart shareholders is that in the last year, they're still beating the market. But the bad news is they're still down 6%. Uh, the company, when they reported, though, like the revenue was still up 8%. Uh, same store sales were up 6.5%, which I was actually, I was very surprised by that number. I thought that was a, a pretty good number. They said the sales growth was led by strength in food and like grocery sales increased in the high teens on a two-year stack. But that there was softness, uh, and this is just what you were just saying, but like in those discretionary categories, such as electronics, apparel, and home products. Dan, how is how is Walmart doing? I mean, they're they're doing as well as any company can be. And that, that same store sales number is incredibly impressive. But I think what has happened with Walmart is they've won some grocery customers they may not have had a shot at pre-pandemic. I think we all shopped grocery sort of as ritual. We live in Florida, you probably go to Publix. There's like eight Publix within you know, any, any place you live here. Uh, there's like one on each side of where I live here. They're really the only grocery stores uh, where, where we live now, though they're building a fresh market. Walmart became really convenient. Curbside pickup, which they spent a lot of money on, was very valuable. Their delivery programs were very valuable during the pandemic. So I'm going to assume that Walmart grabbed some people who otherwise weren't going to be Walmart grocery customers and converted them. And those people might have said, well, if I'm going to buy groceries from them because it's convenient, maybe I will look and say, see if they're cheaper on a TV or a lawn chair or, or a bookcase or clothes or whatever it might be. There's some weirdness. You know, you remember the stories somewhere early in the pandemic where Walmart CEO came out and said, uh, we're selling a lot of tops and not a lot of bottoms. And it's because most people were, were at Zoom right. meetings. And Zoom I'll meetings, tell you right. now, I'm wearing a polo right. shirt right. And, right. and Under Armour shorts. Like I haven't put pants on in, in three years, including like, <laughs> you know, a year of hosting live television uh, sure. over, over our former employer. It's just, so those trends are maybe reversing and you might see in the next few months as companies are quietly getting rid of any sort of vaccine mandates or rules. And even if they're not mandating back to the office, they might be offering it or having meetings in person. You might see some people that had two years of the pandemic where perhaps they didn't take care of themselves or perhaps they used it to, to work out and become you know, a, a different potty type in a good way. Well, they're gonna know, go, go need to buy some nice clothes. And might they do that at, at Walmart and Target? Like there's a limit to what you could buy at, at those places. But I do think you're going to see, you know, a little bit of variable spending. But I think it's fair to say that Walmart and Target very specifically increased their customer base by leaning into what people needed during the pandemic. Target had been doing this anyway and really pivoting its business. Walmart really embraced it and has sort of figured out this model where they don't need to spend as much as Amazon for fulfillment because they can leverage their stores. And that was laughably bad when it started. I think I told you once I, I placed an order for five items that came in four separate boxes. And for the fifth item, it demanded I go to the store to get it. It was like a pencil. Like it wasn't, it was, you know, it wasn't anything important. Or my wife ordered a cooler for her office and it was in the store. And I was walking around the store and they said that they would send me an email when it was ready. I got that email four days later. They fixed a lot of those problems and really have become a very reliable way 
to buy things. And I'm a dedicated Amazon guy, uh, mostly because I pay for Prime and, and it just becomes easy. But there were times during the pandemic where I was like, you know what? Walmart has the taco shells I'd, li I'd like to get. I'll just place a $40 order from Walmart and go, go pick it up because they have something I can't get or I don't want to wait 24 hours even for Amazon, or maybe I didn't want to brave the target during some of the worst of the pandemic where perhaps you didn't want to be around other Floridians. Um, but I feel really bullish on Walmart. There are some pain points here. This is a company that chased away Mark Lorry, its, its top digital executive. And I'm not 100% convinced that they're fully committed to the money it will take to continue to evolve and grow that business. I, you sort of watched how that happened and how we had to sacrifice like every lieutenant to force them to get where they were going. So I do have some worries that I don't have with some of the other players on this list, but the numbers have been, been incredible. They've reinforced their bonds with their existing customers. They've taken less margin in some cases in order to keep prices low. And they've really remembered what they are. And you know, Walmarts are very hit and miss. There, there's one near our, our vacation place that's beautiful. And there's the ones where we used to live that were not, and, and we're not particularly clean or well taken care of. I'd, I'd love to see some of that get ironed out, but I think largely, you know what you're getting. You know the prices are gonna be good. You, you, know, you know, if hey, if I stop by a Walmart liquor, cause I'm coming to Matt's house and I wanna bring a, a, a 12 pack and a, and a bottle of bourbon, and that's just for Matt. Um, <laughs> you know, I know I'm gonna get a good price as opposed to just the liquor store in the strip mall. And I, there's an incredible brand equity there that they've really, they would have been fine if they'd done nothing digital. They would have been a legacy brand that was a bad investment, but still would have chugged along. And now they've really become this omni-channel store after a lot of bumps, like the pickup kiosks and just things that were like too hard to deal with. They've really figured it out and pretty much have the model down. The, the, the curbside pickup for groceries is like, what, that's what we use now. We're in Florida. We shopped at Publix, uh, which is like, you know, a Florida mainstay for decades. You know, we, we shot the Publix for, for, for years. And then we, we finally switched over because the, the value was just, it was just significantly better than Publix offered. And, uh, and, and to your point, like what you were saying, like, it, it's true. Like sometimes like I, I needed some socks for, for, for work, you know, the other day and she was going to pick up the groceries and she was like, well, I'll just go in, you know, and, and buy the socks you need, uh, you know, while I'm there picking up groceries and, and that worked out. So it's, it's, it's things like that. Like they are, they can be pretty convenient for. Them. No, it's a really smart model because the reality is if I go to a Walmart for groceries and I'm actually going to walk around the store, I'm probably going to walk through electronics. I'm probably going to walk over and, you know, look at, you know, the cold medicine and, and whatever, and see if there's anything I need or maybe pick up a toothbrush or, or whatever it is. And they sell a lot of those things at Publix but I'm not gonna randomly walk by to public and go like, oh, you know, we really need a patio umbrella. Like, you know, hey, there's one and it's only 40 bucks. Maybe I should just buy it or take a picture of it and sure. buy it next time. The, being everything is not a bad business model. And Walmart and Target, which we'll talk about later, they're pretty much everything. So let's take that cue and let's talk about Target. Dan, Target struggled a little more in the last year than Walmart. It's down almost 30% in the last year. Um, compared to the market there. But if you take, if you just zoom out a little bit over the last five years before 2022 came, I mean, they were humming pretty good. Uh, on the left here, you see their total revenue just increased every year at a good consistent pace. In 2021, you saw their earnings like just explode in that like post COVID shopping boon. Uh, but that's kind of probably what's causing the, the problems now. But if you zoom out over three years, it's still outperforming the market. They recently uh, like waived their rule for the age of their CEO so that he could stay on. Uh, Dan, how's Target doing? So Target made the mistake of following the legal requirements of the SEC and being honest when they reported earnings. And they said, we have a bunch of bulky inventory that is selling slower than expected. It was televisions. It was you know, whatever limits of furniture they sell, you know, maybe some patio stuff. It was the big, and they said, what we're going to do is we're going to sell this off at a lower price and lower margin 
to clear out our, our warehouses for the holiday season. We think ultimately that will lead to better holiday sales than just having super discounted stuff you kind of don't want at the holiday. TV prices are at Target were so good that I almost bought one before I realized my wife actually wanted a, a television. And I was literally just gonna put the box in the garage until like our TV wore out because it was so inexpensive. But the reality here is Target had a short-term glitch. They're correcting it and they're strengthening their relationship with their customers. Because as a Target customer, I don't care what their inventory is. I'm thrilled that they're saying, hey, we've got some excess stuff, now it's cheap. It, it, it's the same thing as like, you know, on the great day to buy Halloween candy, November 1st. You go to Target, it's all 50% off, and you know what? It's candy, it didn't go bad. It, it's, it's, it's not, you know, produce. So. That's kind of what's happening here is Target had to, they made some mistakes. And frankly, I think some of those mistakes were avoidable. So I, I would look at the person who thought we were going to replace our, our television that we'd sold right. in, in you know, ridiculous numbers. Now, some of that might've been based on, they felt there was still demand because there were the chip issues and it was hard to get. Um, but I think Target is an incredibly well-run company. Getting rid of the ridiculous age rule for the CEO to keep a good CEO. And I'll ask you the question, Matt. Would you rather Bob Iger or Bob Chapik was CEO of Disney right now? I would take Bob Iger. I think any person, including Bob Chapik, would take Bob Iger. And was, was Target really going to get rid of a transformative CEO who has shown that he could handle terrible times? I don't know if many of you remember this listening. The pandemic, pretty awful. Matt and I used to have to go and like meet for dinner outside, afraid that we were going to like kill yep. each other's kids if we got too close to each other. Like it was not a good time. And for retailers, you had to deal with being closed in some markets, only being able to do delivery, uh, you know, the demand for curbside pickup and delivery skyrocketing, what people wanted, figuring out how to deal with like paper towel shortages and hands. Brian Cornell did an incredible job of that. So for him to be there for three more years, and it really should be up to him if he continues to perform as long as he can do the job. And there shouldn't be, and look, put a secession plan in place. It's always good when you know who the next boss is, but if the existing boss is still doing well, you know, the Patriots didn't get rid of Bill Belichick just because Josh McDaniels was a good offensive coordinator. And we'll see how good he is in, in, in uh, Las Vegas this year. But this was a smart move. This company is well run. He's dealt with a lot of problems, a lot of change. You know, I love the biggest thing I think he did was pivoting to the owned and operated brand model. And what does that mean? When you go into Target, they have everything from like their Good and Gather food brand to their Magnolia uh, partnership with Chip and Joanna Gaines. These are brands that Target owns. So Target doesn't have to go to Nike or whoever and say like, well, our terms aren't great. We want more. Like they, they used to sell Champion, which I think is a Reebok brand. They don't have to do that because they made reasonable quality brands at good prices. And in some cases, you know, celebrity partnerships and, and other big names that make you want to go to Target. And then you have things like the longstanding Starbucks deal. I would walk to Target when I at our last place in West Palm Beach in and get a Starbucks most mornings because the real Starbucks was across a four lane highway. So it was easier to walk in there. They're adding Ulta Beauties in hundreds of stores, which are incredibly sticky and give you a reason to be there. You've heard people say this before, but in many ways, Target is the new mall. And you know, I still kind of believe in the old mall, but I've spent a lot of time just walking around a Target with a Starbucks in my hand and sort of believe that there's, you know, there's a lot of cachet to that brand. And Brian Cornell is the one who saved it, who revived it. So I'm very glad he's going to be there. How, how similar are Walmart and Target? Because to my untrained eye, they sell, especially a super Target that sells groceries. They're, they're very similar. Yet I'll say this, like, it feels like people go out to Walmart for value out of necessity, but they want to go to Target. Like, it just seems like it has done a very good job of reaching the suburban wife, mother, you know, so to speak. My daughters, like their, their ideal date with, uh, with my wife is to go to Target and get a Starbucks and buy like a, a new outfit for, for $20. Yeah, my son and I for, have done the same thing. Maybe not so much on the outfit side, but, you know, he'd want to go, you know, get a snack at Starbucks. I'd get a coffee. He'd want to look at, you know, whatever collectible magic cards or video games he was into at the moment. 
I might buy, you know, you know, whatever, a t-shirt or, or who knows what. Walmart is arguably a better grocery store. Uh, it, maybe not the super targets and Target definitely has a better house brand, but there's generally more. Like a, a Walmart is almost a full grocery store, whereas a regular Target's grocery store is still sort of a limited grocery store. There's not that much fresh meat. There's no fresh fish. I mean, there's a little bit of packaged um, it's fine. I, I cooked many a meal from Target, but if I was, you know, somewhere there wasn't a Publix and there was a Walmart, uh, I, I'd be perfectly happy going to the grocery store there, knowing they're going to have everything. When it comes to apparel, Target is a clear step above. You you could buy a bathing suit, a dress shirt from Target, and know it's going to be a little nicer. I think of Walmart as where you get your kids stuff for camp that you know is not coming back right. and you know it's getting washed all in either hot water or cold water. So it's all going to turn pink anyway. Um, you know, and there's a real place in the market for that. And I'm not saying I don't own like a pair of sweatpants from Walmart. I, I'm sure I do. But every bathing suit I own is from Target and I've owned them for five or six years. So the value in the wear, I, I live in Florida and I travel to places with, with pools and beaches a lot. I wear a bathing suit a lot of the time. Um, I have lots of things from Target. Now, so is Target clothing a step below Kohl's in a lot of cases? Yeah, yeah, it probably is. I'm wearing a Kohl's polo, not a, not a Target polo. But I think you could do just fine buying most of your stuff from Target. And with Walmart, I'd say it's a little bit less than that. You know, the bookcase is more likely to be particle board than it right. is any sort of like even like laminate, let alone wood. All right. So our next company we're going to look at is Five Below. Um, Five Below is down 23% in the last year. Uh, this company, though, Dan, we both we both like this company. It's second quarter results. Um, I'm sorry. It's, uh, you know, it's second quarter results kind of highlighted the trials, though, that it's facing because they sell so many discretionary items. And that's kind of what's been like like felt the pinch the most, like by consumers, like uh, when during the conference call, their CEO was talking about the macro environment and talking about like inflation, cutting into consumers' budgets and just how consumers are traveling more and spending less on discretionary products. I still believe though, and I correct me if I'm wrong though, that it's still, it's still a, a differentiated retailer. And I, I love its strategy of like targeting teens and tweens, uh, you know, and having the right products for that at a good value so that they can go there on their limited budgets and still pick up the the trendy item that they want, whether that's like a fidget spinner or slime or uh, squish mallows or, you know, like the new thing. Uh, I just like that strategy. Dan, how's Five Below doing? Yeah, I think Five Below will benefit from a tough economy. Ultimately, heading into Christmas, where else would you get your stocking stuffers other than Five Below? Like the reality is they target teens, but they also target you and I, because my teen isn't nostalgic about Big League Chew or hot tamales or whatever other candies they might have. And they have every candy from our youth and it's all really yeah. affordable. They have, you know, the fun Japanese drinks my son likes that are like $8 when you get them at a sushi restaurant that are like two bucks at five below. You can go in with your kid and hand them $5 and know that they're gonna have fun trying to figure out what to buy. And they might be able to buy more than one thing. Now we've talked about this many times, but are you gonna buy your 15 year old like $30 headphones? Or are you just gonna go to five below and buy like 10 pairs of semi-disposable headphones? Cause you know, they're gonna chew on them and lose them. And every time, every time we buy, like we get, I just stock up on headphones every time I'm there, no doubt. Yeah, like I literally will go look and see. And when they have them like really cheap, I'll just buy a bunch of them. My son's 18 now and he's gotten better at this. And like some things like maybe I'm traveling and I, I'm going to go to the gym and I want a yoga mat. And I'm not going to put that yoga mat in my travel bag. Well, you go to Five Below and get a $4 yoga mat and just be done with it and, and throw it away after the fact. There's so much stuff there that's a value. And even back to school, I'd be pretty surprised if their back to school numbers weren't good because maybe people aren't buying the LL Bean or the Nike backpack that costs $50 made for their kid to lose or destroy. Maybe they did go to Five Below to buy some of their school supplies and, and some of that stuff. This is a company with a brilliant strategy because unlike your typical dollar store, and they're not a dollar store, they sell things you know, generally one to $5, a few things above that. 
but they're bright, they're airy, they're fun to be in. You don't feel, you know, weird taking your, you know, sort of snobbier friends or relatives there. It's not like you're, I hate to say it, we're talking about Dollar General, but like taking them to a Dollar General. It feels like an upscale store that just happens to be inexpensive. There's a real nostalgia retro feel to it. This is one of my absolute favorite companies, both as an investment, but also it's just like, I was thrilled to learn there was a five below down the street when we moved because sometimes it's just fun to go walk around five below and come home with like, you know, you know, Afa and Sika, the wild Samoans from an old WWE figure line or, or, you know, a candy you're nostalgic about or whatever it might be. They're definitely fun. Um, I think that like my kids love going there. We always like every year we just stock up on like pool toys, you know, at the beginning of summer and I just put them out and I know like, okay, they're not going to, they're going to last barely this summer. And, and then we can throw them away because it, they cost five bucks each. Dan, uh, one, I think the most heartening thing about their conference call in their quarter, like even though it was kind of disappointing results, they still said their triple double long-term growth strategy is still on track. And that's tripling the number of stores by 2030 and doubling sales and EPS by 2025. Uh, this chart is from their annual report last year. Since this chart came out, they have now opened their 1200 store in New York City earlier this year. And the company, like they still believe the new stores can be the primary driver behind their growth. Uh, they're on track to open 160 stores this year. And next year, for the first time ever, they're going to open, they, they believe they will open more than 200 new locations. Uh, is it, is, is the market that big for Five Below? Yeah, I, I think it is because anyone can shop at Five Below. And this is a company that benefits from debt, that benefits from density. So in West Palm Beach, where we used to live, there were at least two, maybe three Five Belows, because you're not really going to drive to go to a five below. Like if it's in the strip mall you're at, you're probably going to stop there. It's true. But you're probably, unless you're like going to the movies and need to sneak candy in, like, like there aren't that many, or it's like specifically Christmas or school supplies, but it's kind of an add-on stop. I think of it as like, you want to take the kids to someplace they don't want to go and you bribe them like, hey, we're going to the dentist, but on the way back, we could stop at five below. But the more of them there are, the lower cost it is to move around inventory, to stock the stores, to deal with distribution, supply chain, all the, all the things. So yeah, I, I think they can, they can double, they can triple. You know, this is an in-person business. They do very, very little online, online business. They, they a little bit, but for the most part, this is all about the in-store experience. And I don't think people have tired of leaving the house. People want to go to stores. They're still excited about that. And I don't know anybody like, I don't know, my mom would probably want to go to Five Below and would find something she'd be excited about. I certainly know my wife and kid are. Yeah. So finally, okay, we've done Walmart, Target, Five Below. Let's do Dollar General. Uh, Dan, this might be, as an investment, might be my favorite of the bunch right now. Uh, over the last year, while the S&P 500 has fallen 10%, uh, Dollar General has like soldiered on and they're up 11%. Uh, their quarter results were great. Their net sales were up 9%. Same store sales were up 4.5%. And unlike Target and Walmart that also saw increased sales, their earnings were up too. Um, you know, we're going to talk, I'm sure we're going to talk about this, but their store count is kind of like their, their to me, their, their economic moat. I, I think you used to call this the, like the, the, the moat of convenience or the loyalty of convenience, Dan. I, I forget how you worded it exactly, but they have eight, more than 18,500 locations now across the U.S. And rural consumers make up about 30% of the country. And there is really no one in better position to reach those consumers than Dollar General with their, their vast, vast uh, footprint. And they can do that because each store has a smaller footprint. Um, yeah, it's about a mile. Like, yeah, right, so right, right, right. Dollar General is a different model than other stores. And that's important to know when you're evaluating it. They open a store, that store gets to, I forget the number, but let's say 1.4 million in annual sales. It might be 1.7. It's, it's, it's some number in that range. And then they open another store a mile or two down the road based on where populations are. A lot of the people, Dollar General is the only place they can get to. And Dollar General understands their audience. They sell things like a half a roll of toilet paper and just enough food for the next meal. 
because sometimes that is their customer, but Dollar General is also convenient. There's a, there's a Dollar General about eh, maybe less than a mile from, from our, our vacation place. And the reality is if you want to stock up on things like pool noodles and, and bottled water and other stuff that you know is not going with you when you leave, that's where you'd go. You're not even going to go next door. There's a CVS next door and a Publix across the street. The value at Dollar General. Now, what's the trade-off? Dollar General stores are messy. They're poorly staffed. They're, they're generally, they're empty shelves. It's, it's not a great experience a lot of the time. And I'd like to see them improve that. But they know their audience. They're bringing fresh produce and more coolers into more stores. They're, they're really trying to lean into being a better option, you know, not just saying, hey, you don't have a lot of money, so frozen pizza. It's like, no, you don't have a lot of money here. You know, here we, you can make a salad, you can, you can buy, you know, some fresh chicken and, and grill it or, or whatever it is. They're trying to sort of be good citizens. There were a lot of studies that they would have been the ideal place to, to do vaccination from because they have such a footprint. And at the time, they didn't really have the refrigeration necessary at all the stores. That's something they've been working on and improving. Um, I think this is a chain. They have a greater reach than Walmart. There are more people who live within like two miles. It's probably better at 10 miles for Walmart, but Dollar General is dominant. They are everywhere. They're in every college community. You know, basically they know their audience and sure, there's probably not a lot of Dollar Generals in rich neighborhoods. Also important to note, Dollar General is not a dollar store. Dollar General is a value-based store that is working on selling as many items as possible for a dollar. That is a price point that they have acknowledged in the most recent call. But you might go to Dollar General and buy, you know, you know, whatever, a, 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 a power strip for eight bucks because you need a power strip and you also need a, a iced coffee and three other things because you're away or whatever it is. Um, it is a really good store that has incredibly disciplined management. Those stores are messy by design. They are not spending the money to do some of the things that I would like them to do as fussy target shopper that don't serve the needs of their community. You know, they're not terrible. They're not awful. They're just a little cluttered and sort of always seem like there should be one more person working. But I really like how this company is run. And you talked about management, Dan. So I call these charts X marks the spot where you just have a management team that like uh, they, they a dividend that keeps going up and a share count that keeps going down. And often as a shareholder, that's a pretty good combination. Also, to your point, you know, by the end of the year, they think uh, 3,000 of their basically 19,000 stores will be able to serve fresh produce. And they want that number to keep going up. Uh, as you pointed out, it, the government defines a food desert in the U.S. As a, as a rural consumer who doesn't live within 10 miles of being able to buy fresh produce and, uh, and you know, or fresh food. And, and Dollar General is it's really it's it's really the best solution to 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 fight that you know so three thousand stores by the end of the year serving fresh produce that number will keep going up that's really a, that's another huge untapped need they can meet and there's so many categories they could grow in like they could grow in pharmacy there there's no reason they couldn't you know whether it's partnering with an existing player like a CVS you know even some of these rural communities you might not you you might not have a minute clinic that's running you know nine to five. You might have a doctor who travels in a rural area who has hours at different places. They haven't suggested they're going to do this, but there's all sorts of things they can do because in many ways, not in every community, but Dollar General is often like a tractor supply, a, a, a community hub, a store that's kind of the lifeline. It's the old general store where just everyone goes to. And there's a lot of things you can build off that when they get to the point that they've, you know, achieved 30,000 stores or whatever they think their saturation point is in the U.S. I think they're what, like 19,000 now? Yeah, they're, they're right on the cusp of 19,000. Yep. All right, Dan. So we did the four stores, but I got like a, a lightning round for you. I don't have any uh, special effects to make lightning sounds. Like, you know, um, so we, we got seven questions for you. And, uh, you know, like, well, we're not, we're not timing you. We don't have a timer, but, but, you know, we're, we're, we're looking for like quick, like one minute answers. All right. So here we go. First question is Kohl's. Dan, earlier this summer, Kohl's rejected a $53 per share takeover bid uh, from the vitamin shop owner franchise group. Um, you know, the Kohl's uh, chair, you know, like board, they described that they went through this exhaustive strategic review process 
and that they had discussions with more than 25 interested parties. Dan, I'm not a mathematician, but their, their shares are down to about $30 today. So $53 sounds pretty good. Was this a mistake? Well, first of all, Franchise Group sounds like the name of a generic company where a Spider-Man villain works. Like that, that is a bit of a red flag for me. But the second piece of this here is management and boards don't generally make decisions that cause them to lose their jobs. And CEOs generally believe they can turn it around. I don't think Kohl's is a disaster. I shop at Kohl's. I do think Kohl's is tired. I think a Kohl's Amazon relationship that spotlights Amazon owned and operated brands would be a good way to refresh the merchandise. But Kohl's has not made a lot of the moves that Target has made to make its stores interesting. So I don't know that franchise group was going to fix Kohl's. I do think from an investor point of view, yes, they made the wrong move. For a future of Kohl's, maybe they didn't, but management has not shown me that they're really understanding. They, they've done some things. The Sephora deal is interesting. They've had a couple of different clothing lines and, and deals they've tried, but Target has 80 of those things, 100 of those things. We really need to see just, just a, a brightening and awakening of what they do at Kohl's, and it's possible, but it's difficult, and they probably should have taken the money. All right, next, Royal Caribbean partnered with SpaceX's Starlink for onboard internet. Now, Dan, I'm not, I don't really go on cruises, um, but th this partnership is an effort to combat, uh, I guess, historically bad internet connectivity when cruise ships are at sea. Is this a big deal or even a competitive advantage for Royal Caribbean, or is this just like a, one of those headlines that's a lot of noise? So it's a big deal for me, and I'm not <laughs> sure how many people it's a big deal for. So I, I travel Royal Caribbean a lot, uh, and the internet goes from functional to useless. If there's a lot of people on board and it's not a newer ship, uh, when you're at sea, you might not even be able to check your email. Starlink will make it, I would call it like Starbucks-like, where it's just a pretty good experience. You could do a Zoom meeting. You could, you, know, you could do most things you would do most of the time. So for someone who is often on a cruise ship but actually working like me, it's amazing, but I don't know how big that audience is. I think there's a competitive advantage that lots of people want to be able to send photos home, want to be able to, in a down moment, watch a YouTube video, whatever it might be, but I'm not so sure that people are going to decide, hey, I could go on Carnival, I could go on Norwegian, I could go on Royal Caribbean, and I'm going to go on Royal Caribbean because the internet's awesome. I would make that decision. Like I cruised on Virgin a, a few weeks back, and there were only about 900 people on board, but the internet was, was functionally good. It was, it, was, it was very, very usable, which made me book another Virgin trip. Mm. I do think I am not the norm. I don't think the average person is, you know, staying up till two in the morning and then getting up at 7 a.m. And, and, and writing all day and, and managing a team from a cruise ship or has to attend meetings from a cruise ship. But I do think they're setting a new standard. Carnival had already begun working on better internet by tying in multiple services. Virgin had done the same thing when they launched. So I do think it will become sort of table stakes to at least have functional internet. I am surprised that this isn't a premium offering on Royal Caribbean, where it's just going to become their internet. Maybe prices will go up a little. I thought this was going to be something aimed at people like me that truly need, or parents who are traveling without their kids that really need a great connection. This is actually going to be how it works. And all reports are uh, and then they've been testing this on Freedom of the Seas, which is a ship I've been on, I don't know, six or seven times. Uh, all reports are that it's absolutely fabulous. So it absolutely has me booking more Royal Caribbean cruises. I'm just not sure I'm the typical customer. All right, fair enough. All right, Dan, Starbucks. Starbucks is hiring a new CEO. And Howard Schultz says, I am never coming back. That's what all the headlines said. But the rest of his quote was, because we found the right person. And so, Dan, I just can't help but wonder, like Howard Schultz has uh, come back several times before. Does Starbucks need Howard Schultz to succeed? The new CEO, oh, I hope I don't butcher this name. I'm going to try my best. Laxman near Simon uh, is the current CEO of Reckitt, which is like the Lysol owner. And I know they're a conglomerate. They own other companies. But I'm not sure if that's maybe the best fit. Um, but he's going to take the office, the CEO office in October. Does Starbucks need Howard Schultz, Dan? 
Well, it doesn't need who it hired. And, and I'm, I, look, people surprise you. Everyone was very down, myself included, on Hubert Jolie, who actually turned around and saved Best Buy. He came from an entirely different industry, and it seemed like an odd fit. Turned out to be a great pick. In this case, I think it should have been someone internal. And I understand that Howard Schultz believes there's, there's a need to change at Starbucks, but I actually think that fun functionally he's wrong. Of course, you need to get better at delivery and drive-through and all the the new things that they're doing. But Howard Schultz seems to have soured on the idea of third space. And at a time where we don't have offices, where we aren't going to work, people just go to Starbucks. Like I go to Starbucks three days a week and probably go to a local coffee place the other three just to be around people for a bit. I might, if I have a, a meeting that I don't have to talk a lot, I might just do that meeting from a Starbucks. Yes, they need to change. They need to get more efficient. They need to sort out their labor issue. But Howard Schultz seemed like exactly the right leader to do that if he actually believed in the vision he had when he, when he sort of evolved the company. I'm not sure Starbucks needs this major pivot. I think they mostly need to, to figure out how they're dealing with workers, figure out automation and, and some of the things they're doing, figure out the product line a little bit, because I, I think it was a pretty big screw up with the chicken sandwich that made people sick. Um, and frankly, their food is a little bit uninspiring for the past few years. There's a lot more opportunity in premium and dinner and other things, you know, you know, after dinner dessert in certain markets that they've never quite figured out. And boy, I'd rather Howard Schultz was there, you know, building out the premium brand and the roasteries and all of that, where I go in and pay $30 for a coffee and feel grateful I was able to do that. <laughs> um, you know, the roastery in Seattle is tremendous. And I really think the Howard Schultz strategy that he left his chairman because the previous CEO, uh, Kevin Johnson, I believe his name was, um, yes. that, that you know, they didn't agree on those things. And on one level, Johnson was right because he said, I want to focus on efficiency. And that turned out to be perfect for the pandemic. On the other hand, taking the thousand best Starbucks in the best markets and putting in a premium bar and selling really expensive coffee was a really good business model and it was gonna work really well. Um, so I don't like this move in either direction. I'm glad Howard Schultz is still staying on the board, but I would rather he was executive chairman and involved with the strategy here because when it doesn't work, he's absolutely coming back. Okay, all right. Dan, Amazon is acquiring or wants to acquire iRobot for $61 a share and an all cash transaction that values iRobot at about $1.7 billion. That includes iRobot's net debt. Is this a good move for iRobot shareholders or for Amazon shareholders? Or is this a privacy nightmare? Um, people are going to complain about Amazon having access to like maps of their house. You can go to town hall and get a blueprint for my house. I am not so sure Amazon didn't have access to that information. Did like, is it that valuable for Amazon to know where I placed a lamp or a desk? I like just how they know that, where your guest bedroom is. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a little bit overplayed. Um, it surprises me that Apple didn't buy iRobot. This is an Apple esque product. It is a best in class. Uh, I have an iRobot, as as our mutual friend Steve Symington does on a subscription basis, and they send me all the the stuff I need when they realize I need it. That is a technology they could smooth out the website for it. I still haven't figured out how to tell them I've moved. Um, but the actual product is top of the line. And I think it makes a ton of sense for Amazon just as Amazon makes some products and they're all just kind of mediocre. Having this is great, but it would have been a better fit at, at Apple. And I'm actually surprised this wasn't a bidding war because they own this category. You're not buying a shark, you know, robot vacuum. You're buying a you know, a, a Roomba and the subscription model is an endless revenue model. I'm never getting rid of that. I pay them 25 bucks a month and every three years or something, they send me the newest model and the newest model is always going to be super cool and better. And I'd be likely to buy other products. So um, I think it's a great move for Amazon, but it would have been a better move for other people. It does feel like, uh, you know, that Amazon, if this acquisition goes through and is approved by regulators, that Amazon will have kind of maybe won the home now, right? I mean, because with Ring, with Alexa, with Echo, with Fire, and now this, I mean, it feels like 
this for $1.7 billion, there's a lot of other companies. I mean, Apple being one of them that could have bought this without, I mean, with the, the change in their couch cushions, you know, and their, in their lobby, it, it was not a big acquisition by any means, but you're right. It is a category leader and one that's probably growing. It's growing and there's other things they can, they can build with this technology. I don't know where we're going with, with robots, but there's absolutely other simplified, you know, maybe it's just like a, a shower cleaner. Maybe there's a small little robot that can stick to your wall because I don't know about you. I have a tiled shower. The grout is never clean. There is nothing you could possibly do other than that every time you're taking a shower, bring a Mr. Clean magic eraser with you to keep the grout clean. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's pool robots. Who knows? There's a lot of expansion that could happen here. This is the best product Amazon owns. I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that. And I like Fire TV. I think iRobot is a step above because is Fire TV really better than Roku? No, they're about the same product. Sure. Uh, sure. Apple TV is arguably maybe a little better. Um, but this, this is a coup. I don't think they held out for enough money as a shareholder. I feel like maybe they should have had a bidding war, um, but it is a good deal. And this will be an, a good acquisition. You won't even be able to tell how it's doing because Amazon is so big, uh, but Amazon should fix things like the, the clunky website. Uh, and some of the like, I had a clog earlier and it was like directing me to the web when I'm like, I'm in your app. You can't just tell me there. Like, I think Amazon will fix some of that stuff pretty quickly. I don't know about a shower cleaning robot, but there is probably no amount of money my wife would not pay for a laundry robot where she could come home and all the laundry is done and folded. Uh, I think I, I just can't imagine an amount that would be too high for her. Not a bad idea. And also a robot that cleans out behind your stove. So when we bought this house, Matt, it was a total, like we ripped everything out and we took the stove out, the level of gunk that was back there. And I don't know about <laughs> I you. I, know. I, I don't want to think about my stove. Right. I've lived a lot of places other than when I've replaced my stove. I've never pulled my stove out for cleaning. Yeah, I can promise you, we, we, we put that on the calendar because it was so, we had to use a scraper. Yeah. It was horrifying. <laughs> okay. All right, I'll, now I got to put it on my calendar. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, all right. Next, activist investor Dan Loeb. He recently took a one billion dollar stake in Disney, and he wants Disney to spin off ESPN, a move that he argues would give the sports brand greater flexibility in pursuing opportunities like sports betting, a step that Disney already is allegedly exploring. Dan, is this a good idea? No. You can't sell ESPN if you don't also sell ABC. So the, the, the two are intrinsically tied together in the sports world. And the reality is there aren't a lot of premium products out there. And I understand that what ESPN is, is changing. That we're down to 72 million homes in the cable universe. And the vast majority of those have ESPN, but that's down from like 104 million, like six or seven years ago. So the universe is shrinking, but at some point that will trigger deals where ESPN is allowed to is allowed to market not ESPN plus which is a collection of hot, of extras of you know just random shows and stuff that spill over they're actually going to be able to sell you an ESPN standalone subscription that will be the next big valuable streaming product because if you're a sports fan you need to have ESPN and you don't necessarily want to buy Sling TV to have it and pay 35 bucks. You don't necessarily want to have to get a cable subscription. I think I live in an HOA and you may too. So I have a cable subscription that comes with TV anywhere. So I have a really cool access to ESPN wherever. But ESPN is going to have to figure out its model. It probably can't afford to pay all that many anchors all the money they're paying. And I think that's why you see them move to a model where it's like Stephen A. Smith and Mike Greenberg are kind of the stars. I, I don't think the Joe Buck, Troy Aikman, $20 million deals make a ton of sense or 30 or whatever those numbers are. But I do think ESPN is a Cadillac. Disney has done a terrible job of, job of integrating ESPN into the rest of its universe. Yes, there's the Disney wide world of sports complex. Of sports, right? Yep. But why is ESPN not integrated into one of the theme parks? Why does Magic Kingdom not have a, an interactive sports land where you can like throw a football into a net and Shoot like how cheap is that and like fun and ways to get your kids energy out where they don't have to stand in line there, there hasn't been since they failed with the ESPN sports zones which are actually a pretty cool sports bar they haven't done much with, with the brand there's so much they could do it's the premium brand in sports 
Um, I'm surprised they let the New York Times buy the athletic would have made a lot of sense for, for Disney and ESPN to own that. Um, there is a lot of investment that could be made in content for them. And I, I don't think they have, but selling it does not do ESPN any favors because they're part of a giant conglomerate and that gives them all sorts of leverage with, with cable providers and, and whatnot. There's a lot of people that get ESPN plus because of the bundle that would not be ESPN plus subscribers if you weren't throwing in you know, Hulu essentially for free. Um, so no, selling it is a terrible idea. And it's the kind of thing you say to get on CNBC or get people to talk about you. Okay. All right. Next, Amazon introduced Buy With Prime, which is a new way for third-party merchants to grow their direct-to-consumer stores. And they can do that by attracting and converting shoppers with Prime, which offers, like, gives, gives these third-party uh, sellers access to Amazon's logistics and fulfillment and delivery and checkout experiences that shoppers know and trust. And after first like seemingly embracing the idea though, Shopify has now kind has now kind of done a 180 and they say it violates uh, buy with prime violates like their their terms of service and that could have dire consequences for sellers businesses. Now they say it's because of like fraud and things like that. Dan, is Shopify scared of buy with Prime? So I think everybody's scared of buy with Prime because as much as Amazon has been good for a lot of marketplace retailers, they also take their data. Like there's a, there's a reason why retail stores didn't want to use Amazon checkout. You, you know, your local toy store doesn't want to tell Amazon how many copies of Settlers of Catan they're selling or, or, or Dungeons and Dragon dice or whatever it might be. And some of this is, Amazon controls the process. It, they warehouse the items. There are costs associated with that. It's not overly transparent. So I don't know that it's inherently bad, but I think a lot of companies are going to approach it warily. And Shopify has found itself in a position where they underestimated how many billions they're going to have to spend on infrastructure. So they're probably not super thrilled when Amazon does anything that might get it more market share. So, you know, I'm pretty sure that they're not the ones who get the big voice in criticism here, but um, this is, it's really going to be the merchants that decide whether this is successful uh, because there are costs associated with it and the warehousing and, and all of that. And do they make more money or does Amazon use it to create new products or sell their own products or whatever it is? Amazon's been accused of that. It's hard to know exactly how often it's happening. So there's a lot to watch here. All right, and last one, Dan, last one. Uh, Top Gun Maverick, as of last week, had gross uh, $1.4 billion worldwide. It's just been an incredible smash hit. I will say personally, I saw it and I loved it. Uh, Dan, is Top Gun Maverick proof that movie theaters still have a viable business model in a post-COVID world or is it closer to the industry's last hurrah? So it's not a last hurrah, but the movie industry has to figure out what to do when they don't have a Top Gun Maverick or a Spider-Man or a very small list of movies. We're just not going to a movie theater anymore to see a mid-level romantic comedy. They don't even try to make like Sandra Bullock and Ryan Reynolds, you know, hate each other and then fall in love or whatever it is. Well, it goes straight to streaming now, right? Like I yeah. think there is a Sandra Bullock rom-com on like Paramount Plus or one of those. Right. So it's yeah. one of those things where sure, we're going to go see Doctor Strange, which I actually just watched, but I watched it at home on my television. We're going to go see the big movies, but I think there's fewer and fewer of those that matter because I'm a huge Marvel guy and I didn't see Thor or Doctor Strange because I knew they were coming to Disney Plus in a few weeks. And I think you with you know, last I counted four kids, but we haven't seen it in like a couple <laughs> yeah, of months. Yeah, but four, I, kids, four, kids. four kids. That's a huge expense to go to the theater. So that's $60 in tickets conservatively. If you're sneaking in candy, that's another like 10 bucks. If you're buying candy there, it's like another 40 bucks. Yeah. Like that becomes a hundred dollar night. It's a hundred dollar night. Yeah. That's very different than me and my son go, but, you know, so sure. the economics of it, but that being said, it takes a lot to make me to want to go to the movies when I know that like in a month or two, 
after my wife goes to bed, I'll have another thing I really want to watch that I could watch over a couple of nights. Like I think Thor comes out tomorrow on, on Disney Plus. Does, or, or today or tomorrow. Maybe yeah. today. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I know my son saw it in the theater with friends actually, but I know I'm going to watch it and I'm going to be excited to watch it. So I do think the movie theater business is gone and that we might have some new model of like two or three screens that do, you know, UFC pay-per-views like uh, near, near me in, in, in Davenport, Florida, in, in Kissimmee technically is a, oh God, what is it? it's, a, it's a movie theater grill. And my son and I went there uh, about a year ago to watch a, a wrestling pay-per-view. And it was kind of awesome. Like there, were, there weren't a lot of other people there. We did it because we wanted to be around other people for a sporting-ish event. Uh, but you could order a beer, you could order food. The food wasn't bad. Like it was a really enjoyable experience for something that if I bought it at home, it would have cost me 50 bucks. So spending 25 bucks for the two of us for a ticket was a wash and we would have ordered food. I would have taken a beer out of the fridge. Like it was just a really nice way to do it. I think you're going to see that for like things like here in Florida. Um, you might see Patriots or Yankees games that are just regularly on a theater somewhere that sort of replaces the bar experience or, or you know, there's a lot of people from the Northeast here. You're going to see more like concerts where like the Rolling Stones only play 10 or 11 gigs on a tour and maybe eight of them are, are broadcast and you can go see them a certain way. But the model of like 18 Oplex screens, there's nothing to show on them. So the whole thing is dead. And people get very mad at me when, when I talk about, you know, AMC wants to pretend they have a business, but like investing in like mining and just throwing around the word crypto at your right 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 it, it, this isn't a business and you know look i don't know about you matt but i have a 65 inch television in the other room it's pretty awesome it's not back when we had a 32 inch television. exactly exactly you know, the home experience is great and i haven't seen top gun yet um just wasn't my favorite movie the first time so i wasn't that excited about it but i'll absolutely watch it when i probably never would have paid for it so they'll in some way or other make, make that money from me or, or you know, at least monetize me in some way. The business is changing. We're, we're going to see more small movies and giant movies. We're not going to see as many middle movies. All right, Dan, thank you so much for coming on and joining us. If people are interested in following you and seeing more of your content, where, where can they find you? Well, you can find me and my team at thestreet.com. Uh, I do write a lot uh, about the cruise industry, about travel, about Disney, about Las Vegas, sort of all the things those of you who, who know me over the years know I love to write about. And, you know, what's different about the street from some of the other places I've been is it sort of embraces all types of investing. You know, it's not just long-term investing. There, there are people who write about technicals. And some of that stuff, I look at it as these are all tools for long-term investing because I, I don't do any short-term investing. But all of that is kind of there and available for you. We're growing. We're evolving. It's been a ton of fun. Matt, this was fun to do. Well, let's get dinner again soon. Uh, I'm Matthew Cochran. We're 7 Investing, and we're here to uh, empower you to invest in your future. Have a great day, everyone.